the kingdom of heaven is to hear what is not said. To see what cannot be seen. And to know unknown and knowable. That is a law. Today, the Center for Race, Ethnicity, and Human Rights is proud to present another prominent voice of Aloha. Professor Gariana Kumaikari McGregor is a historian at the University of Hawaii at Manoa. She is a founding member of the Ethnic Studies Department and has been a key activist in the protest of Olao Ohana. This grassroots organization is dedicated to the island of Olao and the principles of Aloha Aina. These principles have significant similarities that reach across the globe. Dr. McGregor visits different communities, including those of academic scholarship. For example, in the last year, he published several articles and chapters in Sweden, and facts of astronomy on indigenous testimony and traditional practices as evident at Maunatia, a research report for the National Academies of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine. Melana Lama, reconnecting as native Hawaiian woman through cultural history in the book Our Voices, Our Histories, Asian American and Pacific Islander Women, edited by Shirley Key and Gail and Nomura. And forthcoming, the preservation of indigenous cultures in Hawaii in the book Rootless Handbook of Race and Ethnicity in India, edited by Soto University of America's Vice President of Academic Affairs. Professor Michael Wiener. We have a unique format today, along with Dr. McGregor, uh, a community from around the world has gathered online to participate, also reflecting Sopa University of America's reopening to in-person academics. Students have gathered in community uh, to engage with Dr. McGregor's talk here in the Daisaku Ikeda Grand Reading Room. A question and answer session uh, for the audience members will follow Dr. McGregor's talk. If you're online and have a question, please use uh, the hand raise tool. For those in the audience, uh, please use the microphone here uh, to ask the questions. If you're in person, there is no need to sign in on Zoom, but uh, if you're on Zoom, please make sure that you mute yourself, uh, the mic and the speaker. Uh, I'm excited to introduce the center's faculty and student fellows uh, who will also help moderate discussion. Uh, the center is co-directed by Dr. Uh, Kevin Monty and Ian Reed. Faculty fellows for the year 2021-2022 uh, are Drs. Dita McLeod, uh, Nadani henderson Stuff, and Pablo Camus. I'm joined by two incoming student fellows, Abui and uh, Kofi Saikaji. The talk tonight is titled Stopping Military Use of Kaho Lawe, Reconnecting with the Sacred. On behalf of the Center for Race, Ethnicity, Human Rights and the students of SUA, welcome Professor McGregor. We hope you have a meaningful session with me this afternoon and we look forward to learning more about Kaho Lawe from you. Thank you very much. Um, mahalo Nui Loa for that nice introduction or thank you very much. I'm going to be sharing um, my screen here so you can see. Um, I want to share the images, the imagery, and the beauty of um, Kanaloa Kohola Bay. I'm trying to get it to center. Okay, there we go. Is that good for everyone? Um, thanks, especially to Michael Weiner and Ian Reed for um, the work we did in uh, publication and uh, inviting me and to the center. Um, um, for race, ethnicity, and human rights um, at Soka University of America. Um, I, I want to share a mo'olelo, a history and a story both together of how um, Native Hawaiians reconnected with our sense of the sacred and our sacred ancestors and really I would say connected to our soul as a people through our struggle to stop the military abuse of the island of um, Koholawe. So I'm going to also try to show that in the approach that the Native Hawaiians took to um, end the bombing of the island and all the military use that we, we took in a particularly Indigenous Native Hawaiian approach to organizing our people. And, and it was grounded in spiritual beliefs and customs and practices. 
And major breakthroughs um, that we made at each step along the way were accompanied or um, I guess preceded by major ceremonies and prayers that we offered uh, to our, um, our Kua, who we, we believe are our elemental forms around us, the universal life forces. So I, I felt that I wanted to tell the story in that way because it seemed to align with the mission and approach that your, um, your university takes and, and the philosophy underlying your, your university's um, uh, teaching. So um, it's the first time I'm doing this, but I'm trying to play with it and, and make sure. So I welcome questions. And if you wanna along the way ask questions, I'm good with that too. And uh, it's, a, it, you know, I'll kind of pause and see if there's any questions at different points as well. I think that might work. I know that someone <laughs> in the um, in the showing of the video that you watched had asked the question is uh, if um, this struggle is an example of a decolonial struggle or decolonization. And I would say definitely we um, it is um, a decolonial struggle, not only in challenging the United States Navy um, uh, the U.S. military, the largest military in the world, um, and winning, but um, um, but it, it in in our approach to reclaiming our spiritual customs and beliefs and practices, it, 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 in that sense, it was a decolonial practice of reclaiming and um, reviving our um, our beliefs and customs and practices and our rights as Hawaiians to do that. So I'd like to open, and this is what we're we're what we're looking at Koholabe from it, where we are, the view from here would be somewhere on Ulupalaku on the slopes of Haleakala, looking across the Alala Keiki Channel to Koholabe. Um, sort of it has clouds today, but sometimes it looks when it's like that, it looks like a whale, you know, its form out of the ocean, which is one of the forms of Kanaloa, the, the god of the ocean, and the island is was believed to be by our ancestors, another form of the Hawaiian god of the ocean, uh, wh whose name is um, Kanaloa. So I wanna do a, a chant to open our set, our, my presentation and your, this mo'olelo. Um, hopefully it'll help uh, set a space aside that we're entering into a time to understand Kanaloa and its workings in our modern lives. And, um, it's a chant that was gifted to us by Uncle Harry Mitchell from Kenai on Maui, and he learned it from his ancestors. And the chant speaks of um, uh, men in a double hull canoe on the ocean approaching Koholabe, and they see it, and they said it's all bright and shining, like, like lit up like heaven to them after journeying across the ocean for 20 some days, right? And they dedicate the island to Kanaloa of the shallow and the deep sea. So it's talking about how in the west side of the island is a place called Laio Keale Kahiki, the point of the pathway to Tahiti. And that was a major departure point and return point for voyages that deliberate voyages and intentional voyages that took place between Hawaii and Tahiti. And this was, as I said, the launching point and the return point. And this, this chant in a way speaks of that. It goes, Uina, kaulona kapu aikawa, vehe vehe mai ne kahiao, ku mai na waa kaulua, ku eke kanaka mai kawa mai, ku kuluka ivi o ka aina, aila ni kohe malama lama, ho o hiki ke a moku ya kanaloa, a kua ka moana ili moana uli, ho o hiki ke aloha no ke ya aina e, aloha no kamana o na kupuna. All right, my, let's start with my um, slideshow now. So I wanted to just share some images of the island. This is um, uh, how the island looks like a fetus. Can you see that? Like there's the butt and there's like the, the, the legs there um, bended at the knee, the head. Um, this is another image of the island. Um, and um, in terms of the origins of the island in our genealogy chants and the ko'ihonua for our islands or the origin chants, it says that Kahoolabe was born of Wakea Kahiku 
Luamea with Papa Hanau Moku. And Papa and Wakea are our sky, Wakea is the sky entity and Papa is the earth entity. And in our chants, it speaks of birthing of these islands and uh, Ko'olawe was born. Um, and it says in the chant, it says it was Hepunu, a, a fledgling and he nai, a, a, a porpoise child. Um, and, and that after it was born, the afterbirth or the Ieve was, was put into the channel, was cast into the channel and lies there as this little islet of Molokini. And then it speaks of other deities who were part other nature forms, natural life forces that helped create the island saying that Pele, the goddess of our volcano, came and brought the ocean to Kaho'olawe. And then her brother, who is Kamoholi'i, um, the shark deity that brings the Pele family um, of volcanic deities to Hawaii, um, has a home here at Kanapo called Lua o Kamoholi'i, or the abyss of Lono of Kamoholi'i. So these are other entities that are associated with this island, although Kanaloa is the main, the Hawaiian god of the ocean. Um, the, the name Kaho'olawe is more, more recent than the ancient names, the more recent name, and it means to be carried away with the currents. And of course, there are a lot of currents around the island as a nice swift current taking you south to Tahiti. Kaho'olawe could also be interpreted to mean to take and embrace. But our kupuna, as we began to discover when we went out to speak with them, our kupuna or our elders, they said that the more ancient name of the island was Kanaloa, this god of the ocean. Uh, and another name that they gave us was Kohe Malamalama o Kanaloa. Kohe is a vagina. And so what, we, what how our kupuna interpreted it is the shining birth canal of Kanaloa. Or maybe it is like a portal into the deep knowledge of Kanaloa because the island was a center for training of navigators. And another way, another name is Kohemalamalamo Kanaloa, saying it a little differently, which means the southern beacon of Kanaloa or lying to the left and lit up like heaven. And yet another uh, reference to the island is Kahikimoi, where the sun sets and the spirit goes to rest. Now the island was um, of course settled by fishers and farmers. And um, <coughs> there are these uh, ko'a, we call them fish, there are ko'a, there are fishing shrines that were erected. And the features of them is this upright stone and then pieces of coral. And then offerings were brought to, the, um, to these fishing shrines when, when fish were caught, sorry. Um, and they were constructed so that they mark the fishing ground in the ocean. So this particular koa is on the side of a cliff into the Hakiava Bay. And we think it's marking a koa or fishing ground in the ocean, in the bay for he'e, because we find these, um, these uh, uh, kari shells, which are used for lures to catch he'e. But there are 69 of these fishing shrines all around the island forming like a lay around the island. Now, uh, the uh, island comes under the rule of Kamehameha when he defeated uh, the Maui chiefs. And then um, we hear that um, Ka'ahumanu, um, uh, his, uh, and Kamehameha II is the um, heir of King Kamehameha and we have Ka'ahumanu. And when they assume the control of the monarchy, uh, they abolished the traditional Hawaiian belief system in 1819, and they abolished the divinity of the chiefs so that they become more secular rulers at this time. And, you know, um, we, what they begin to do is really um, undermine the sacredness of the island. Um, Ka'ahumanu sets up a prison on the island at a place called Kaulana, and those who are banished there are are found guilty of, if they're found guilty of crimes of adultery, theft, or converting to Catholicism. <laughs> so the, the um, Ka Ka High Chief Ka'ahumanu was, uh, adopted the Ten Commandments into the government. And so if you were found guilty of violating these, ten com these particular commandments, then you were banished to the island, which was a real departure from how sacred the island had been um, during our ancestors' times preceding uh, Ka'ahumanu. 
But the desiccation of the island continued, which is why there is a disconnection. And I say we have to reconnect with the sacred. Commercial development followed um, the use of the prison use of the island of prison. So there was goat and sheep and cattle ranching on the island. Uh, this is a picture of the, the ranch headquarters at Kuhi'ia. And all of this combined contributed to large scale erosion, something like 10 feet of topsoil has washed off the island. And all we have is this hard pad as a result of the erosion and also very deep gully formation and a lot of sediment rushing off into the ocean. And then on the day after Pearl Harbor was bombed on December 8th, then 1941, that day, the, the bombing was December 7th, the, um, the island, martial law was declared and the island was, was uh, claimed to come under the control of the US Navy. And the US Navy used the island for um, uh, a ship to shore target practice, also for um, bombing. And during World War II, the staging of landings that were to be made on major islands in the Pacific when they were um, uh, retaken by the Americans. So um, every major landing and on a, you know, and battle on major islands like Tarara and other islands in the Pacific. We're staged here first on Goolabi. And at, at the time you see, I don't know if you can tell what this is, but these are actually targets for the ship to shore bombardment. And they are made out of um, tires that are painted white. So there were these two large targets on the island landscape. And this is one of those bombs that didn't explode. They also, um, in the 60s, um, uh, exploded 500 tons of TNT in three uh, tests uh, to simulate an atomic bomb blast and to see the impact of the atomic bomb blast on ships anchored near, near shore, nearby, like here, and impact on communications with those ships. So, um, you know, we, I grew up not knowing much about the island, except, you know, they called it the target island because it was used for military training. But then in 1976, a call to action was put out. We call it a kahea, call to action. And it was put out by Charlie Maxwell, who was, um, had been a policeman on Maui and was active with a group called Aloha, Aboriginal Lands of Hawaiian Ancestry. And Aloha had uh, introduced a bill in Congress for the United States to pay reparations to Native Hawaiians for the illegal role of the United States in the overthrow of our Hawaiian monarchy. And the bill was languishing in Congress. And so Charlie called all around the different islands. I got one of those calls too. And he said, you know, um, they're not taking us seriously. They think we're all happy Hawaiians playing music on the beach and dancing hula. We have to show that these claims are serious and we have to show that we have serious problems as native Hawaiians. You know, at the time we had high incarceration rates, like 60% of the prisons were Hawaiian men and women. And, um, uh, and we had um, about 30% of our people are living at poverty level. And we had, um, high unemployment and low, no numbers in professions and um, high school dropout issues and very poor health because of poor diet, because of poor income. So we had a lot, we have a lot of serious problems that continue, although some have improved, but this is what he was getting at in terms of calling for the US to make reparations for the tragic overthrow of our, <laughs> of our queen and the trauma start trauma that leads to social and economic um, issues. So the actual landing, he said, we need to occupy federal land, US federal land to call national attention to our problems as Native Hawaiians. We need to have our own wounded knee, which is what the Native Americans had to get their uh, Self-Determination Act passed. So um, that was the, and then the actual ignition, shall we say, was, the first landing that the call came to show up on Maui and the next day boats were going to go over to Kohalabi and land and occupy the island uh, to get our recognition of our claims and our rights. And um, this was the first stage, the, the 
the igniting of interest, the spark of interest, awakening ourselves, beginning the process of reconnecting with this island that we had been separated from because of the bombing. So nine people landed. Uh, there were several boats that showed up, but the Coast Guard said they would confiscate the vessels. And so most of them turned back. Um, but nine made it through. And if you saw the Fox video, they talked about that first landing. And um, um, Noah Emmett Aluli and Walter Ritty stayed two nights on the island. Uh, this is um, Dr. Aluli here. And then these are some of the others who were on the land. Most of them were arrested, but Emmett and Walter Ritty were not shown in any of the pictures right here. Um, they stayed two nights and then they, they saw all the destruction, but they also felt a very strong spiritual force. And so when they came off of the island, they went to our kupuna and our elders, excuse me, and, um, and they asked for an interpretation of um, what they felt and what was this island, you know? And the kupuna started to share how this island was extremely sacred and, um, and, um, Within a month, on February 13th, oh, that should be 1969, <laughs> sorry, not 29, 1969, 1976, rather, February 13th, 1976, permission was gotten for a landing um, to go and ask permission at, for our generation to come and re-enter the island and help to steward the island. So our kupuna, such as, um, this is uh, kupuna, kahuna, um, la'au la'pa'au, healing kahuna, uh, priest uh, Sam Lono and Auntie Emma de Fries, who was also a, a kuna, kahuna of, of sort. She, um, they both said that we needed to ask permission. We needed to have a ceremony to connect with our the spiritual forces on the island and ask their permission as young people to come and begin to work to, to, to uh, steward the island, stop the bombing and heal the island. And so this ceremony was carried out here at Hakio Ava. That's um, the drink of Ava and thing. And um, I guess we had an affirmation that permission was given. So um, stage two was um, comprised of direct action, organizing and outreach. And the direct action was having grassroots Hawaiians from all the islands, says George and Walter Ritty and Emmett went to visit all the islands and um, got people from all the islands to come and occupy the island as well. There was like, I think 11 different occupations in the first year. And those of course led to arrests and then court cases. This is actually um, those who were arrested outside of the courthouse um, after their, their trials. They organized concerts on every island and, and rallies. And um, at that time, also a civil suit was filed against the, the Navy saying that they were in violation of the executive order because they were, they were not doing anything about the goats and the, the executive order said the Navy had to eradicate the goats on the island. They were in violation of environmental protection laws because um, uh, uh, there was no study of the impact of the bombing on the island. They were in violation of historic preservation laws. They were not protecting the cultural and historical sites on the island. Um, and they were in violation of the American Indian Religious Freedom Act, which says that native people have a right to go on federal land, especially military land for our religious ceremonies and, and purposes. So um, that was filed and uh, the, we continued to um, organize, but the organizing was in a very Hawaiian way, as we saw that first, and you know, the first thing that we said was, we just don't go without permission. We acknowledge that this, we're not, we're not come on, we're not from this, that, that island, none of us have been born on the island. So um, do we have permission to go and start this organizing work? Um, the second was um, that we, you know, and we did prayer we, to ask that permission, but also um, as we went, they went out island to island, they involved the kupuna in giving direction and guidelines to how to organize. And one of the most important advice given by the kupuna, Auntie Edith Kanaka'ole, was to call ourselves the Protect Kaho'olawe Ohana. And she said, 
it had been called the Protect Kaholavi Association, but she said, no, we have to organize as an extended family for this island. This island, we have to view it as a child that we want to surround and embrace and protect from abuse. And we are going to become a family to this island. And then the third thing was that um, the, the slogan that we organized around, it wasn't stop the bombing. Initially, the slogan was stop the bombing. Um, and Target shirts were made and stop the bombing. But the slogan became a Hawaiian slogan, Aloha Aina. And you folks know our, uh, the person who introduced me referred to Aloha. But Aloha Aina is to love and respect the land. Aloha Aina also means nationalism and patriotism. Um, loyalty to our nation of people. Aloha Aina also means to love and respect our akua, our deities that are the natural life forces. So this was all part of the outreach to our kupuna and the, the feedback that we got, you know, that this was, um, we want to seek creation, you know, it's to, to come up with a counter narrative to what the Navy was doing on the island, creation, not desecration proper use, not gross misuse, respect of the land, not abuse, self-sufficiency, not false dependency, living heritage, not a museum heritage, um, a, a, a refuge, a, not an off-limits place, but a refuge and caretakers, not owners. Um, so we're contrasting the, the dominant uh, framework of the US Navy with that of love and aloha and care for the land. Um, and these are the values that sustained us for many generations. Well, the, the, we, ha we had a big setback um, in March, 1977. We lost um, Kimo Mitchell showed here and George Helm. This is also George Helm playing music. He was a beautiful musician. They went to the island. Two men were on the island, Richard Sawyer and um, Walter Rady were there. Uh, they felt that if they were there on the island on a long-term occupation and by the time they went to get them, they had been there about two months, they felt that as long as someone was there, the, the bombing would stop. And for a while it worked, but then the, the Navy announced that they, were, they didn't believe anybody was on the island. They couldn't find them with their heat seeking equipment. So they, they went and started, they said they were gonna start bombing the island again. And so George and Kimo went to get these men off, get Richard Sawyer and Walter Reedy off the island. But instead they themselves got lost. Um, in the ocean. And there's many reasons, you know, thoughts about what happened, believe that there was some foul play. And we, it was a very tragic loss for the movement, for the Ohana of Koholabe, for the families of these men and the communities that they lived in. So the, um, the loss was too great. The risk of continuing occupation was too high. The price was too high to pay, having lost the lives of these two men. And so we entered into stage three, a period of um, education um, and litigation. And um, the, uh, uh, the Ohana began to seriously pursue the civil suit that I mentioned earlier. And the court began to agree with the Ohana and said that the Navy was in violation of these laws and that the Navy would have to provide access to the Protect Kalabi Ohana and to jointly uh, govern the island with the um, Protect Kalabi Ohana. Now, um, about six months before the final agreement was made with the um, military and a consent decree enabling the Ohana to bring families to the island, there was a, 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 a legal access where the Ohana invited elders, kupuna from all the different islands, and they asked them to walk the land with them and to share their understanding and manao, to share the mo'olelo that they knew about the island, to share the chants that they had learned about the island, to tell us what were the place names and how to interpret the place names. So again, a very Hawaiian approach to organizing um, and to um, uh, you know, respectful of the elders, excuse me, and um, acknowledging that there's a lot of knowledge that our kupunas were the bearers of. So these kupuna, as you can see, some of them were in their 70s maybe, 
and they had been born in the early 1900s and their parents had been born under the kingdom and their grandparents before that under the kingdom and their parents spoke pure Hawaiian and these kupuna still learned and understood a new Hawaiian. So their knowledge was vast about the island. And so it's from them that we learned um, uh, about the different places. Um, Uncle Harry Mitchell's here explaining about this, another fishing shrine. But some of the places that we learned about, and this is the fishing shrine he was standing on, there's the Ai Ai uh, fishing shrine. In our traditions, the practice of establishing these shrines and then bringing offerings back to uh, these shrines is that you're honoring Ku'ula. Ku'ula is the deity that can call the fish or bring the fish uh, to the fishermen. And so they would kahea, call to the fish. And when they came back, they would give their first caught fish on these altars. But it started, this started across the channel in Maui. And the first two were built on Maui, and the first three were built on Maui. And then Oh, yeah, it came across the Alala Kiki channel here to Hakuaba. This is the fourth uh, shrine that was made when this, this practice of honoring our fishing deities was established. And this is a historical um, a fishing shrine that is in our, our chants and our legends and our oli. Um, there was one particular kupuna, Homer Hayes, who knew that the uh, the channel, the Ke'ali Kiki channel was right on a north, a directly north-south alignment. And he had heard um, that there were, uh, there was on the, the point, on the land by the point, compass rocks. And you, I don't know if it's hard to see, but these are like, oops, these are four big compass rocks. One, two, four big pohaku. And then they are spaced so that there's a, a line that goes, passes between them there and here. This alignment, this cross and cross there, this way aligns true north-south, and this pathway aligns east-west. So it is um, a compass rock that factored into the observations that were made from this point at uh, the pathway to Tahiti. And then on the, um, on the top of the island at a place called Moa Ula'iki is this pohaku. And in the chant that I started off with, there's another stanza which goes, talks about pohaku ahu aiku pele kapili o ke ave iki. The, the bell stone, this is a bell stone also, it, it, it echoes when you pound it, and then into which is needed the hidden knowledge of Keavi Iki. And our kupuna said that here at this top was a navigation school, not just to learn about navigation, but to learn about the universe. The, um, um, the, the, the kahuna were trained here, were those who were astronomers and, and who, um, who watched the passage of time and understood the way the, the systems of the universe and, um, and they were the Kilopai Honua uh, Kahuna, which is spoken of in the chant. And um, Uncle Sam Lono, um, at one point uh, later, not this time, but he knew of a navigator's chair at this site. And he sent his um, students to come and find it. And they found that this is, you know, this is the flat stone that's the chair part of it, and here the backing, and here another view of it and found this navigator's chair here at Moa Ula Iki. So um, the, um, in December, on December 1st, um, 1980, so this is four years into the movement, the um, court mandated that the Navy sign this consent decree, which the Ohana also signed a consent decree. And that started a period of joint governance of the island. It's the first time that a Native Hawaiian organization is recognized by the US government to have joint stewardship of land that they use and that they have title to. And under this consent decree, the Navy had to stop bombing the island for 10 days every month. And then within that 10 day period, they, the Ohana were given access to the island for our religious and cultural practices for four days. And within the 10 day period, the Navy had to begin to clean up the surface of ordnance. And uh, so this was an opening now for the Ohana. Again, a very Hawaiian approach to, to organizing to say, if we want to get people to uh, help stop the bombing, they have to 
touch the land. They have to be touched in their souls by this island in the same way that we were touched in our souls by this island. So we brought cultural field trips to the island, families, students and teachers, community leaders, halau um, or schools of Hawaiian hula and, and learning. And so throughout this period, we, we began to also um, open up new cultural sites. This is when we're, when we're on the island, we cook our food in an emu, we're making the emu there. But we also began to um, rededicate um, cultural sites. But importantly, we began to reintroduce the Hawaiian religious practices. Um, and the one that was given to us by Auntie Edith Kanaka Ole and her daughter Nalani Kanaka Ole was the makahiki practice. Um, this is a, a this is seasonal. The makahiki is a time that is beginning now. Today is the uh, summer, so uh, summer equinox, fall equinox rather. Fall equinox in Hawaiian, Piko Awakea, when this, the Piko Awakea is the equator, the, the you know, belly button of Wakea, the sun rises, um, true east at Piko Awakea. And now the sun will start its journey south to Keala uh, Polihiva to the to the uh, Capricorn the, um, uh, Cancers, the Capricorn Tropic of Capricorn. Sorry, but in this, as the sun begins this pa passage south, then our rainy season comes, and the the storms come from the big thunder lightning storms come out of the south, and these are forms that are kupuna personified as Lono. So all of, when we say Lono, it's not, there were, there were human, there were a human Akua, there were chief, chiefs who were Lono, but Lono is really this pattern, this weather system, this pattern that begins to change as the, as the weather begins to change after the equinox and the days become cooler and, and then the, the winds come from out of the south, they bring these heavy storms, the, these rains, um, then you know, sink into the to the land and re, it re, replenishes our water table, and it allows our plants the, and the cycle of life for our plantings to begin. So we make an image of Lono, and we have processions, and we give whole kupu or offerings, and this was the ceremony that was started. Um, and the the last time we know, pub, last time this was publicly the makiki was publicly performed was in 1819. Before the, before the chiefs who were supporting our religion went into battle against Liholiho and Ka'ahumanu who were abolishing our religion. And so um, in October of 1819 was the last time that there was this public offering and, and uh, prayers to Lono. And we began to revive it over a hundred years later in 19, uh, 1992 we began this ceremony and we conduct this ceremony. It's been 40 years now. We, put, we open it every um, November and we close it in uh, February. And we annually go there to call the rains to come and help heal the island. We also introduced um, ceremonies to Kanaloa, the god of the ocean. Now, someone also asked if we went out and did outreach with um, internationally. And we did, we were part of what is called the Nuclear Free and Independent Pacific Movement. And um, one of the things that we were aligned with is that um, annually the, or the US Navy would invite navies from around the Pacific to joint military exercises and they were called Rim of the Pacific Exercises. And the final ex part of the exercise was all the navies would gang up and do ship to shore shelling of the island. And we were just astounded when we found this out. And so we went, we went uh, through, the, through the nuclear free Pacific movement. We had contact in Japan with the um, socialist party and they were members of, in the diet there and they sponsored um, um, legislations to stop Japan's participation in the RIMPAC, especially to stop Japan's participation in the bombing of Koholawe. And they were successful, they succeeded um, in, in stopping Japan from participating in that phase of the RIMPAC. Um, we went with our Maori um, neighbors and relatives and cousins to their, their parliament uh, to stop New Zealand from participating. And they were successful in doing that. In fact, Eventually, New Zealand withdrew from the um, treaty that 
uh, required them to participate in these exercises. And with the peace activists and the aboriginals in um, Australia, we also got Australia to stop participating. So we tried to go to Canada. Um, Canada refused and continued, continued to bomb the island. Britain was going to come and we worked with the, um, the women who were working on the peace movement in Britain to stop. So um, yes, we did. And part of our a ceremony to stop the RIMPAC and eventually to stop the island was to open up a ceremony to Kanaloa, Kanaloa of the island of the ocean, and ask him to you, hey, this is one other form, and it's a slippery form. He said to slip away the island and all the bad that was being done to the island. We also dedicate, built and dedicated a pa hula where hula could be performed to Laka, the goddess of the hula. And we dedicated this pa hula during the makiki so you can see the lono overseeing this dedication here. Um, and finally, on October 22, 1990, we succeeding in having President Bush call a halt to all military uh, ordinance delivery training on Koholabe. It, 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 you know, we, we had started in 1976. So this was now what, 14 years later, um, 10 years since the consent decree and we had stewardship of the island, 10 years going to the island, bringing more people to touch the island. And the 10 years resulted finally in October 22 and 1990, ending all military use of the island. And it was because President Bush wanted our Congresswoman Patricia Psyche to get elected to the Senate. And she said, for a Republican to get elected in a democratic state like Hawaii, I would have to perform a miracle. And he said, well, tell me what that miracle would be. And she said, stopping the bombing of Koholabe. And so he did. And, um, uh, and then we, um, then the um, Congress set up a conveyance commission to come back two years later and report what should happen to the island. I'm going to pause here because it's been a while and it's, um, I'm sure you uh, but I'll just pause and take any questions here, and then I can talk about what happened after um, the bombing stopped. But let me let me pause here and oops, I keep going. Yeah, let me pause here and stop the sharing and see if there's any questions or comments or thoughts. Something is in the chat. Oh, please raise your hand if you have a question. Oh, come up to the mic if you're in the room, I think. And if you're online, um, write it in the chat, a comment or. Hi, hi, aloha. Thank you very much for uh, everything that you said so far. It's been really educated. Um, I had one question about when you were taking people onto the island for their ceremonies and everything. Um, since the bombing technically didn't stop at that particular time, it was like you sharing the land with the military while they were bombing. And then at a point, there was like the ceremonies and the healing going on. So during those times, what were some of the challenges? Like for instance, uh, even if I'm a student, I wouldn't want to say go to a, an island where I know there are bombs that haven't even gone up yet. And like there are a lot of like health dangers and uh, there's a lot of things that go on in the island, which isn't safe for like the ceremonies and everything. So how did you uh, sort of deal with that? And how did that affect um, the land reclamation process in general? Yeah, yeah, thank you. That's a great question. Yeah. So um, we, even though we were there and the steward, of course, they didn't trust us. And so where we, where we camped, it was, um, it's a split valley. And so we would camp on one side of the valley. And they would camp, and that's the meaning of the place, Hakua was split valley. And they camped on the other side, we were on the, the, the west side, they were on the east side. And then um, they said that when we went out and we, if we hiked or even in our procession, they would have to have their explosive ordinance uh, men precede our procession and uh, go ahead of us to make sure the area was clear and there was no ordinance. Um, and so that became a huge bone of contention for us because um, sometimes when we were 
performing our ceremonies, they would, they, you know, they'd be talking and laughing. It was disruptive to our ceremony. Um, another time, right after we had offered our whole kupu, and you know, we cook our whole kupu so it smells delicious, so it attracts that energy, right, to come into it. Um, and then they started to, they were, you know, going to leave the next day and they were burning their rubbish, which, you know, is not a good smell. And um, so that was another bone of contention for us. Um, and just saying that, you know, in our religious procession, Lono should lead the way, the, you know, not the military. So we had to work on that a lot. Finally, what we said is, you know, why don't you go the day before we get there and walk the paths? We tell, we're telling you, you know, just exactly where we're going to go. Walk the path the day before and clear it. And therefore, then you don't have to come with us. So that was one, one way we dealt with that. Um, but there was also times that they would misfire. Um, and uh, so, you know, there was still the ongoing concern that they still were being allowed to shell the island and use the island for ordinance training. Um, and uh, there were a few occasions where it lost, it, it went off, they, they, you know, they didn't reach their target and um, it, it damaged um, uh, an ads quarry, was, was on the edge of an ads quarry. Um, and um, yeah, we were so concerned that they were camping next to us. And a funny thing, what happened is that we have a place, a beach where the women would go to bathe and we would be, you know, we could take off our clothes and bathe just the women and they happened to come and they knew we were there they came to watch us and so we were furious and we reported it and said you know this is what happens when you allow them to camp in our it, next to us they we you don't trust us but we don't trust them and we want them out of here there's no reason they have to be camping here with us and you know it's kind of at the same time that there are issues of of sexual abuse in military bases in okinawa um, as well, and um, and so it was a it was a touchy subject, and so they finally gave way, and they didn't camp with us. We had our we could camp there by ourselves, and then we would they would hike down in the morning to meet us for the hike up, and but and on the way down they would clear the pathway, make sure everything was cleared, so then we could we could help hike up, and they could be behind us. Those kind of things, yeah. For ten years we had to. Uh, jockey and, and leverage and um, you know when we'd come they'd say welcome to Kohlavi it's like this is not your place this is our place not your place don't tell us welcome <laughs> I don't know if that answers your question but yeah those are thank you for asking so I could share those um, incidents <laughs> any other questions or thoughts Hi, Professor. Um, hi. Hi, my name is Nikki Inomine. I'm a SUA alumni from the class of 2016. Um, yeah, let me put on my video. I don't know if that matters, but hi. hi. Um, my, I'm first generation American, but my family on both sides come from Okinawa. So military occupation is something that um, I've kind of learned through them and learned through my grandma, especially. Um, I guess my question, well, one, I just want to say thank you so much for bringing this topic to SUA. Um, and my question is, you know, being in the States, I feel so far removed from the elders. I feel so far removed from being able to really do anything. Um, and I know there's kind of a movement in the U.S. to have these Okinawan Americans or anyone from as a result of the diaspora now living in the U.S. to reconnect, learn about our culture, learn about it, learn from our elders. But, you know, there's a language barrier. There is distance between us. Um, and sometimes I just feel like it's very difficult. And so you were talking a little bit about the international solidarity that you found in different countries. Um, I guess, could you share a little bit about maybe some of the connections that you've drawn with Okinawa and maybe sometimes how um, like youth can get involved in that decolonizing um, or just start talking about the military occupation of Okinawa when we're just so far away from it? 
Yes. Yeah, the um, Okinawans were very supportive of our effort to stop the bombing of Koholabe, and they invited us to um, to visit Okinawa and to share our experiences with them. And they shared their experiences with us, of course. Um, I remember when I went, they um, they were watching. It was just still during the Vietnam War, and they were watching the bases and they were counting how many you know, what, what kind of carriers are leaving and estimating how much, how many bombs are being, you know, sent out of Okinawa to, to do the bombing runs um, at Vietnam. Um, so they were very much a part of the movement to also stop the Vietnam War and um, which was an unjust war and a, a war of imperialist design really. And um, we, we, but they were very much supportive of our, our movement in um, Hawaii, uh, you know, and understanding the importance of the island as a, a religious center for them. They could appreciate that very much. Um, and of course we have Okinawans in Hawaii and Okinawans who are part of our movement here, Okinawan Hawaiians, I guess, Okinawan Amer um, um, of, um, Americans of Okinawan ancestry. And so they also um, participated uh, as well and could, could again, um, it resonated with them because of what they knew about the history of Okinawa and the U.S. presence and occupation of Okinawa as well. Um, I, I, I think, you know, we didn't have the benefit of social media to make connections. We, you know, we, we had to travel and meet people or, um, you know, couldn't use we just phone, of course, but it was all very expensive. Nothing was free. Um, like social media is, but you're so much have so much more advantages uh, to be connected and to share experiences. Um, I I don't know what I know the um, they were there because of the pressure uh, in Okinawa against the um, military bases that met, many of them were then moving to Guam, which then created a new problem for the people in Guam and the Chamorro people there to have increased military buildup because um, they, you know, they had to move out of uh, Okinawa because of uh, bad relationships that had happened there. So um, I, I think it's just, you know, help, helping to encourage each other to keep up the resistance, um, to share stories, and, and to have cultural exchange is really important. I mean, just, you know, having people come to the island with us and, and experience it with us and, you know, feel how we felt is very important. That was worth a million words. I mean, they, they go back and they share what they experienced. They worked as the examples I gave, they worked with um, in their governments to, to stop the their role, the, the role of the military in Hawaii. Yeah. But yeah, I think um, even, you know, there's a, there's a nice movement. Uh, we have a strong Okinawan community in Hawaii. There, um, you know, um, dances and, um, um, Fat and community gatherings and everything. So my, my the associate for the Center for Oral History that works with me is um, uh, of Okinawan ancestry also. And he, he went to study in Okinawa too uh, when he was in college. Thank you for sharing. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Let's uh, see, there's something in the chat. Thank you for giving us a wonderful lecture. How was people's condition of lives while US government controlled Hawaii? Is there any discrimination toward Hawaiians? And definitely, this is what um, uh, this is why uh, when I said Charlie Maxwell was putting out the call, he was seeking reparations from the U.S. for the social injustices against Native Hawaiians. So um, the discrimination is um, uh, apparent in the um, disparities in income levels, where at least thirty percent of our population at the time. Now it's maybe still about 20% 20, 20 that are on welfare or, um, or we made up 30% of people on welfare and we only made up 20% of the population at that time. Um, and as I said, lack of access to social justice in the court system um, because uh, you know, the, the, the arrest rate of Hawaiians and non-Hawaiians is the same, but the um, conviction rate for Native Hawaiians is higher because Native Hawaiians don't have access to representation. Um, it's not that they're more guilty, it's just that they don't navigate the system eff effectively because they can't afford to pay the cost of representation. Um, and healthcare, 
um, we have the highest rates of heart disease, of um, 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 I was going to say vaginal cancers um, um, and um, diabetes um, and and I said heart disease. So of course this is all compounded by you know the lack of income, the stress of not having jobs. Um, I think we make up about twenty percent of the homeless population, maybe a little more. We're overrepresented now in the homeless population. In 76, we didn't have homeless people. It just started, you know, that's more something from the 90s or 2000 that we have homeless people, but um, people couldn't, already couldn't afford to buy a house in 1976. They had done a survey and they said 80% of the people living in Hawaii couldn't afford to buy a house because the houses they were building were to attract people from um, the United States. And, and investments were made to build up tourist resorts to attract tourists. and everything in our economy is organized toward attracting tourists. So our cost of living is extremely high because of it's based on tourism economy. They're talking too much. <laughs> um, what, 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 what kind of interest do you, what kind of questions do you have about Hawaii or how is your interest about Hawaii and our, um, and our island of Koholabe, what, what what interest might you have? Thank you. Hi, Dr. Wiesberger. Um, my name is Susan Plata, and I'm the faculty fellows of the Rare Center. Um, I was curious about, I teach uh, human rights here at SOCA, and was interested in how the uh, indigenous rights movement connected with the work that you're doing as an activist in, in Hawaii and how do the connections transnationally uh, impact that as the uh, Declaration for Indigenous Rights has worked its way through the UN and there's quite a lot of uh, international organization facilitated by technology like this. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Yes. Yeah, we do have delegations that go to the United Nations and um, one of the persons who's been doing that is uh, Dr. Lili Kalakamaele Hiva, who's at our Center for Hawaiian Studies at UH Manoa. And every year she's taken students um, and some faculty to uh, sit in on the, the meetings of the uh, UN Committee for on Indigenous People. I don't know the exact name of it, but uh, following from the UN um, Declaration on the Rights, there's a, a convening every year that, um, she does participate in to represent our Native Hawaiian claims. Um, and um, I think the other international uh, level at which we interact is um, um, through the uh, conservation movement. So the International uh, Conser I IUCN, International Union of Conservation uh, Nations, or, um, and, and they have international gatherings um, there was one actually in Jeju um, that our, one of our members went about maybe six years ago or seven years ago to share our story and to um, network with other indigenous peoples who are working to protect their sacred sites. Um, there was a filmmaker, Toby McLeod. I'm not sure what the second film was that you saw, but Toby McLeod made a He's with the Sacred Lands Institute, and he made a film looking at um, issues of protection of sacred sites in, um, in the US in, at Mount Shasta in the Washington state and um, in Siberia um, in the Altai region and in um, Kenya uh, and with the, with the nomads there and um, conflicts with Christians there and then um, in Peru, where climate change is uh, uh, impacting the Incas who live in the high Chilean highlands there, uh, and you know the glaciers uh, changing their ability to, to continue their cycles of planting, and the Aboriginals as well, and the um, impact of mining, and also in Papua New Guinea, the impact of um, Chinese mining uh, on the island and depositing the 
the tailings in the ocean. So, he, you know, he brought together people from all these um, countries, all of us who are working to protect our sacred places. And so they got together in Jeju, <laughs> looking at how can we set international policy for protection of sacred sites, um, international recognition of sacred sites. And, you know, there are world heritage sites, but um, how do we also protect them as sacred sites? And then again, there was a gathering in Hawaii and they came and we hosted them on Koholawe. And then the most recent one is in France that I didn't go, but people from Hawaii went to that. So um, also looking at stewards of lands and stewardship of sacred sites as another level of interaction and movement. And then we had our hokulea, our, 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 voy our voyaging canoe, our double hook voyaging canoe that um, did a around the world um, voyage ca called uh, Malama Honua to, to take care of the earth. And so they, as the canoe came, this little canoe, I mean, by comparison to these big, huge cruise ships, this little canoe went around the world bringing the message of aloha aina to every place they went to we as all peoples who live on the ocean we need to take care of our ocean and our lands so that's another way of um the hokule is also going to be making uh they, they were supposed to start a voyage this year but of covid it, it's being postponed i believe but they were going to just do a um a voyage around the pacific and connecting pacific island peoples uh and pacific rim peoples as well Um, so I want to share what happened after we stopped the bombing, because that was in 1990. So that's been, um, I think, how many years is that? 90, 90, 2010. Yeah, so it's been about 30 something years. And um, yeah, we just celebrated that 30, 30th. And then um, uh, just to see, because, you know, we stopped the bombing, but then the question was, well, what's going to happen now? Are, is tourism gonna come here? You know, cause like on Molokini, that little islet that I said was the afterbirth of Koholawe, it, it's this beautiful crater that's sunken. And so there's all these boats that come and bring people to, to um, dive there and to scuba dive there. And, you know, we could just see that happening on Koholawe. Um, or, or were they gonna clean it to an extent where they could have golf courses or a resort there, you know, and that, that would kind of defeat our whole purpose of Aloha Aina and the protection of the island is sacred. And that was even a greater challenge, frankly, because it still is a challenge. Every so many years, new ideas in the legislature say, um, this is costing us too much to maintain what's our, what's our give back. Why don't you have commercial activities on this island to generate revenue, to support your operations? And it's not looking at the island as a sacred place. So, um, the other thing was that the cleanup of the ordinance happened and it was, we were shocked because all the, all the manufacturers of these bombs and weapons are the same companies that come to clean it up. So they're making money with creating the bombs and then they're making money with removing the ones that are, have been exploded or even unexploded. So that was a kind of shock to us as well at that point. So let me um, just talk about just the stages following that. And again, looking at this interplay and dialectic between politics and religion, our religious ceremony, our prayer, that our prayer, we offer prayers um, to help us uh, break through on key political moments. So um, there was a, the, the, uh, when the bombing stopped, Congress set up a commission, Koholawe Island Conveyance Commission to study the island for two years and decide should the Navy come back should bombing continue or should, or what, what are you going to, what use are you going to make of the island? Because it was bombed, you know? And so they did a study. They found out how much it would cost to clean up. It would cost millions, billion probably. Um, the Congress was willing to give $400 million for the cleanup. That's what they gave. Um, the, finally, the commission said this, Island should be recognized as a national cultural treasure for the native Hawaiian people where they can learn about and practice Hawaiian culture and religion. So we were, we were so happy for that. But what happened was at the end of the two year period of negotiation, 
the commission really in an unprecedented mood decided to have a healing ceremony. And so we built this, this is, um, uh, we call it a muaha'i kupuna, like a monument or place. And then, oops, sorry. Um, yeah, I totally missed it. Sorry, too many buttons that are super sensitive here. Okay, um, let me try again. Um, and let me back up here. So yeah, we have this, um, and we invited um, our se senior senator, Senator Daniel Inouye at the time, our Congress people, um, the governor, the governor brought his son, um, the Office of Hawaiian Affairs, the kupuna from each island. And we sat around here, they each had a stone to sit on and ava was served. And when they took their ava, they had to make a promise. With, if they were gonna drink this ava, they had to make a commitment that they would do everything they could in their power to keep the island safe and to bring the island back home to the people. And they drank, they drank this ava. And this ceremony was important to seal that commitment by these decision makers. And at that point, we knew the island was going to be safe. And that was the recommendation moving forward. No, no, no resumption of military use. It would be, the island would be at peace and for use as a cultural center for Native Hawaiians. Um, and then became um, the, the, the law that was set up in the state legislature. We had a Hawaiian governor at the time, Governor John Waihe'e. And he said, when the, island when, the, when the island comes back to the state of Hawaii, that they will hold it in trust for eventual transfer to the native Hawaiian people. So it would be managed as a cultural trust for indigenous Hawaiians. And when the Hawaiian people reestablish our government, the island would be turned over as the first lands, the first sovereign lands to the native Hawaiian nation. And the, and the law also says that there will be no commercial use of the island. And part of the reason was because there, you know, all around the island, we were concerned about, you know, scuba diving and snorkeling tours and just coming in for the day and picnicking tours and such. But the, the, what the commission found was that there was so much ordinance in the ocean, they couldn't clear it. There's no way to clear the ocean around the island. And the military traditionally had, um, had a two mile boundary around the island that remained the two miles. So the, the reserve, they set up a Kualabi Island Reserve Commission that is inclusive of two miles of ocean and the around the island and the island. And um, because it couldn't be cleaned up, it was safe from commercial development. So these agreements were made and on May 7th, 1994, a deed transferring title from the US Navy to the state of Hawaii was signed. Um, this is uh, William, William Cassidy who represented the, he was the uh, um, uh, Deputy Department of Secretary of Defense. This is, was our governor, John Waihe'e, who was Native Hawaiian governor, um, the first one since uh, statehood. Uh, this was the commander in at that time of the Navy. And this is Noah Emmett-Aluli, uh, Dr. Noah Emmett-Aluli, who represented the Protect Kalabi Ohana. So um, it was a huge celebration, the day of return of the island of Koholawe. And um, I just wanted to share this. Um, this is from our program that day. There was the sounding of a hundred poo. So I think that what it was is that, I forget how many, 10, 10 people do it 10 times or a hundred people blew it uh, together. As many people as can, you line the beach and we blew our poo, poo the, the conch shell to announce the opening. And, um, and then there were the beating of drums, 50 beats of the ceremonial drum. Uh, there was a chant, the genealogical origins of the island. Um, and then there were offerings made um, by the governor, by the Hawaii congressional delegates, by um, yes, Deputy Assistant Secretary William Cassidy for the Navy, um, Clayton He for the Office of Hawaiian Affairs, uh, so the mayor of Maui County, um, the Koalavi Island Reserve Commission, and um, our Patek Labi Ohana. It was a, a joyous day of celebration and ceremony again. And as I said, the idea that the island will be transferred to um, the sovereign Hawaiian governing entity. Now came the next phase beginning in 1994, the cleanup. And there was a 10 year period. They said, Congress gave us $400 million, but we got to clean up the island within 
as much as you could do clean up in 10 years. And so this is, it went all over the, they, they couldn't go over the whole island. We had to prioritize the uses of the island. And eventually this is what it ended up. So the, the light green areas here and there, and then, oh, sorry, right around the island. Oops. Yeah, and uh, um, uh, coastline to inland trails and then a coastal trail around the island and then roads and areas for planting. Those are all cleared to a depth of four feet. And it's only 9% of the island. You can see that it's only 9% of the island. And then this general yellow area is 68% um, of the island. And um, it is only surface cleared. And then these pink areas is 23% of the island was not cleared at all. And that was $400 million. So um, don't know what it would take to entirely clean up or maybe um, better equipment their technology will help us eventually clean it up. But you know what? It's what's keeping the island from, safe from development. Um, there was even proposals for casinos to be built there on the island. Okay, and then comes the stage seven, next seven, and the Navy finally leaves the island. So once the cleanup is done, it goes through 2004, the Navy leaves the island in March 2004. They turn over control of the island to the Kolabi Island Reserve Commission in 2003. And so we have a big celebration again. And um, we invite all the early warriors, the people who landed on the island in 1976 and 77, some of them were barred from coming back to the island by the Navy. Now that the Navy's gone, they feel safe to come back and enjoy what they had you know, put their lives on the line for really back in 76, 77. And then we also invited the various schools of Hawaiian navigation because all of our kupuna said, this island was a center for training and navigation. So we built this um, platform here. This is a navigational platform to observe the stars. Oops. And um, the key thing here, this is right, at the point of the pathway to Tahiti. Um, and what uh, Nainoa Thompson, our premier uh, navigator from Hawaii said that this was an ideal place to in the evening to watch in the north to see the position of the North Star, which is about here in relation to the Southern Cross, which is sitting here. And the Southern Cross is visible in Hawaii from around um, February to June. And so if you, if you see how, how the North Star looks in relation to the Southern Cross as it sits over, when you're on Koholabe, you memorize that image and, you, and the, how the other stars move around it. When you go south to Tahiti, the Southern Cross will come higher over the horizon and the North Star will go lower until you're in the, the latitude of Tahiti. And then you know the, so you don't, you, I don't even know, I haven't looked, you, if you can see the North Star, but you know how to come home now because to come back to Hawaii, you got to go against the Northeast trade winds. So you got to go far east of Hawaii until you know you're in the latitude of Hawaii. And how the navigators know they're in the latitude of Hawaii is when the North Star sits over the horizon in relation to the Southern Cross over the horizon as it looks over Koholabe. Then you know you're in the latitude of Hawaii and then you can go east to hip. So that's what they're observing when they come there. Um, and then part of this is a more aggressive revegetation of the whole island, um, putting in water tanks, water catchment systems. To, we don't have water. We're not, we're not tapping into the groundwater. Some of the groundwater was, um, was um, the groundwater, the earth was cracked when the three 500 ton explosions occurred. So the water tables cracked. So there's not that much fresh water lens on this island. So we put in catchment systems to catch the water and hold them in large tanks. And here again is where we do prayer and we, we draw upon ceremony to call for those rains. We have the, the, the call for those makahiki seasonal rains. We also call for the rain cloud that used to connect from Maui to uh, Koholabe. So we're on the top, this is on the top of Koholabe and we're looking at Maui. Our kupuna says, and we see it, there is a rain cloud, the Naulu rain cloud that would connect from Ulupalakua on Maui to Koholabe and bring the rain, 
that the island needed. And then the cloud would reconnect go to Lanai and even to Molokai. So that's what we erected this shrine, a fish. This is a rain shrine now. And we do ceremonies and chants to call the rain to come back to Koholawe. The, the at the first rains now, um, they're gonna go out next weekend to do this ceremony. And then we have a cultural plan that the Edith Kanaka Ole Foundation gave us, which gives us the ceremonies. And they're saying what, what we should be doing on the island is when whoever comes with us comes to train to be a cultural practitioner. And that involves observation, you know, observation, morning observations, what the day is going to bring, how the clouds look, where the birds coming, and the seasonal changes, the shifts in the weather, start to kilo that and observe or observe that document it so you become knowledgeable about what the weather will be at different times of the year and what you will see growing what plant will be dominant in the rainy season what plant will now be dominant in the dry season what fish will be dominant at which time of year there's because they have different spawning times and uh, different uh, limus grow when the whether there's lots of rain or not enough rain so kilo observe so you know what to anticipate and plan for the other thing is to do work, do the work to clear the invasive species so the native species can come back, do the work to rebuild the, the cultural sites, do the work to stabilize the sites our ancestors left us and rededicate them, do the work to um, just, you know, cab the pathways that we, we're real, working on a around the island pathway to connect uh, one ahupua'a, one valley to the other, so we have better way to steward the land. And then there's ho'ohenoheno, which has brought us to this point, the ceremonies that connect us to our natural life forces to call those energy forces to, you know, to, to have the land be fertile, to just um, have the, the ocean be productive. And so it's a school in the plan. It says it's a, it's a place for all schools of Hawaiian culture to come and practice. Um, these are young children that are learn, learning. Um, it was a, a college program for high school students. Um, the Polynesian Voyaging Society, um, halau, uh, hula halau, tapa makers um, or kapa makers and weavers, you know, come and spend the time in this safe space, this pu'uhonua on Koholawe to learn your culture. So that brings me to the end of my story. It's a story of Aloha Aina. Aloha Aina is pule, as I have said. It's pule to our, our natural elements, our, we call akua, the gods. It's, it's, it's steadfast nationalism to regain the sovereignty for our native Hawaiian people. And it's um, dedicated stewardship a wise stewardship of our cultural resources informed by our observations and what our chants tell us about what to grow. It's perseverance. It's never giving up. It's perseverance, you know, through hard times and, and, and loss, tragic loss of our two men, Kimo Mitchell and George Helm. Perseverance to make sure their sacrifice was not in vain. It's dedication to this island that we are family, we are the family for this island. We're dedicated to help this island come back to life. And it's that commitment for us and our generations that we will continue and when, you know, the generations will continue to come and bring this island back to life. So that's my story of uh, Kanaloa Koholabe. And someday we'll reach stage eight when it'll be recognized and the sovereign Hawaiian nation will be reestablished. So our, our vision is that when we, ha, we always say, i ola kana loa, i ola ka ko, when koho alavi flourishes, we will flourish. So maybe you first can help me say that. I'm going to say, i ola kana loa, you say after me, i ola kana loa, one more time, i ola kana loa, and then you say, so that, and then we will flourish. I ola kako, i ola kako. Again, i ola kanaloa, i ola kako. Okay, that's the end of my story. Thank you so much, everybody. You're so good.
Okay, I think you folks have to go before the cafeteria closes. <laughs> well, thank you very much, Professor Mandego. Um, we really appreciate you taking time to come speak with us. Uh, we've all really learned a lot today, and we really hope that whatever we've learned here today, we can keep like using it to make more impactful change in our community today. So thank you very much. Um, oh yes, thank you so much. The the Center for Race, Ethnicity, and Human Rights would also like like to welcome everyone to also like bring their ideas on future activities for like this for the center. We welcome any ideas students may have, and we're also looking forward to like hosting more programs like this in the future. So if any student has any more ideas, you can feel free to reach out to any of the student fellows or the faculty fellows. Oh, just send anyone an email, or you can approach any of us on campus and we will be happy to talk to you too. So once again, thank you very much for coming here, Professor Mateo. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you so much for your hospitality. I know I was invited to come in person and I really thought very deeply wanting to do that, um, but I was, you know, and I'm glad I didn't because then the, you know, Delta variant started going, but I am so privileged and honored to be invited to share with you. And I wish we could have spent time in person getting to know each other better. Um, I put my email in the chat, uh, daviana at hawaii.edu. So if you want to follow up on anything, please contact me. And then we also have our uh, Protect Koholawe Ohana uh, website too. And you can look up what I've been talking about. Oh, that should be protect kaholaviohana.org and um, and then there's um, the Kaholavi Island Reserve Commission too. They have a, a beautiful website. Thank you so much, everyone. Aloha and have a good evening. Be safe and be well. Aloha. Mm-hmm.